Hey everyone and welcome to Almost Cancelled, I am Peter, that is Connor and we are going to talk about Fargo Season 3, Episode 3, it's called The Law of Non-Contradiction, full spoilers for the episode as always. I So many first thoughts, first of all, having an episode of Fargo set in LA is really weird. Yeah. I don't yeah. like it, it makes me feel uneasy, all that sunlight. <laughs> do, do you know what else I feel is weird? Yeah. Seeing a... A Hollywood Christmas story on TV that's not Shane Black. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's also true. Uh, so, but the, the, the setting was so so different to the point where the in the you know the opening sort of little thing that comes up, it actually said the events took place in Los Angeles in 2010. Yeah, but it was so weird to the point where when it cut to like Minnesota when she was uh, phoning her son when when Gloria was phoning her son. That I seen the snow and I was like, oh, like, okay, things are okay. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. snow's still there. <laughs> it felt comforting to see that snowy landscape. It was just weird. Uh, but yeah, I'm so sure that's, how that, that's how she feels at the end. I'm, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it is. But she, that, so this was a, a weird episode. It felt, well, I say weird. It, well, it was weird as well. But it, it, it focused on Gloria's character. She goes to LA to try and investigate Thaddeus, the the previous. Uh, Alias. Well, that was his real name, I suppose. But obviously, uh, Ennis, uh, her grandfather, her step dad, was killed, and she's there to investigate his past because she's got you know the the photo of him in the newspaper of getting this award, and she's in LA looking looking to see what happened. I'm not convinced it's him. You're not convinced it's him. You don't think it, you think this is all a... for for a very particular reason. Right, go on. They told us, I think it was uh, last episode or the end of the first one, when, when when he died, he was 82. So, this is 2010, so he'd have been born in, what, 1928. So, for 75, he should have been about 47. Right, okay. That guy was not 47. I, I agree, he seemed much younger than that. Yeah. And it's it's possible they could be just a, a mistake with the, the ages and the dates but I feel like I expect better than that wouldn't, wouldn't, from all. Yeah, but wouldn't Gloria think of this though? Me- yeah, maybe well, Wouldn't Gloria see that the ages don't line up or something like that? Yeah, I don't know She should I, mean, I, I guess I mean, Maybe there'll, there'll be another twist to it and she'll it, it'll become clear why this is but yeah, yeah, that didn't even occur to me. I was just kind of taking, yeah, taking yeah, it in. Yeah. I was too busy trying to decode robot cartoons instead of <laughs> yeah. thinking about this. Uh, There's that too. Yeah, well, I guess stars in this one that were notable as well. We had we had Ray Wise. So Leland, Leland Palmer showed up. And what I thought was funny about that is there was a couple of Lynch, David Lynch-esque things in this episode. Namely, this weird box felt very David Lynch. It felt very... Because it's set in LA, very Mulholland Drive, having this weird box that's just doing... Mm. This weird thing, uh, and we'll get into that. Uh, we also had Mac from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, who I did not recognise at first. I had to hear his voice. Did you not? I had to hear his voice for a couple of sentences to place who it was because I'm like, he seems familiar. It's who the moustache, is isn't it? Yeah, who is this prick? Uh, and the funny thing is, is the more I seen of him, the more it became clear he was still just Mac. He just happened to be a cop. Yeah, Th- this happened to me in season one because we had Dennis, but he put on the accent. Because obviously mm. he was still in Minnesota. That's what threw. It took me a second to get him at the time because it was like, oh, the accent. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Obviously here he's just meant to be in LA, so he just got his own accent. Yeah. Although he does make fun of her accent a little bit and does a few sentences. And it is glorious. Yeah, it's glorious for Gloria. Yes, very good. Yeah, I very good. That very good. Uh, round of applause. <laughs> it, was, it was not intentional. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. So she, she looks into this, we get some flashbacks as well, we open, I think we have three in total, I think we have one at the start, one in the middle, one sort of near the end. Mm. We have flashbacks of this, this Thaddeus stuff happening in the 70s. A couple of small points I really want, there's a few nice little links to season two in this episode that I really liked. Mm. Whenever it was in the 70s, it did split screen, which they did last yeah. season. So it was like a, a thematic, just a nice little technique. Just on a technical level. Yeah, just on a technical level, it was like, oh, if we're in the 70s, we do that, because... Yeah. It's the same 70s. Things were split screen in the 70s. Uh, there was also something in the robot cartoon. There was like a UFO that beamed someone up at the end and nothing with the light and that. And it made me think of season two. Yeah. There's definitely bits of that seeping in, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, she, she investigates the stuff and it basically goes nowhere. It, it's basically a dead end. Like it, it, She basically discovers that this has seems to have nothing to do with why he was killed. 
Uh, and it's yeah. almost confirmed at the end when she when they get the fingerprints and it's uh, Maurice that we know, and she even finds out oh he died with a, <laughs> from an air conditioner <laughs> unit falling on his head. Uh, and there's no there's no well. I was going to say there's no Ewan McGregor in this episode. Technically there is. He does a voice for one of the cartoon characters in his own accent, might I add. But there's no Stussies, there's no none of that plot yeah. in here anywhere. It's and, all the LA stuff. That's actually really... You, know, you said at the start this was a, a weird episode of Fargo. Yeah. And I think just structurally, even taking it out of just that, like focusing on one character so heavily, I don't think Fargo's ever done an episode like this. I don't remember one, but I, I, I well, no, nah, there was one season two that was kind of close. Do you remember the one that, uh, it, it was basically just a couple in the cabin and. Yeah, but that still had like, you know, there was two of them and, and you had the other guy there. Sure. They were all playing off each other still. But this was literally just the one character. It's not a million miles away from it though. They really just said, we're going to focus on one thing. No, okay. That's fair. So I, I don't think it's super, uh, like weird in that sense, but it was weird for a lot of reasons. But I mean, very few episodes of Fargo have had cartoon interludes, certainly. Uh, so, in terms of the guest stars, as well, by the way, I, I don't know. Did, did, were you thinking that the, uh, the both the young and the old Vivian, you know, one from the flashbacks, and then we see the old version in present day? Were you thinking, oh, they did a good casting job here? They look quite similar. Yeah, that's because they're mother and daughter. <laughs> um, they, in fact, uh, it's Clint Eastwood's wife and daughter specifically. Oh, fair enough. I, w- uh, I would never have known that. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's why they look so convincingly like oh that does look like her when she's older it's because they're actually the same family so that's pretty cool uh, so we get this story in the flashbacks of how how uh, Thaddeus was like corrupted by this producer because we see at the start of the, the flashbacks that he doesn't even drink alcohol he's not even into that but by the end of it they've got him like snorting cocaine and th- doing whatever else and they, they steal all of his money and they, they, they corrupt him and they, they uh, just just run him and make him into nothing and it makes me, maybe thematically, I'm worried that maybe Glory is going down a similar sort of path. Because obviously we see her, you know, when she gets to the bar with Mac and he's like, mm. oh, do you want a beer? She's like, no, diet pop. And she she doesn't want to drink either, really. Oh, I never really thought about that. I, I, I didn't interpret her involvement in this. Because even though they kept doing that thing where she'd like open the same door that he did in the flashback. Because yeah. like, she, she made a point of going to the same like motel and stuff. Uh, and I never took it as that. I, I, I related her more to the robot in the cartoon. I did, generally speaking, but just that sort of, that there made me, you know, notice. So certainly, if we go back into the whole like, East and West thing, if if we were tying it into that stuff, I feel like this this LA stuff is kind of like a oh, here's what the the, the corruption of the West. It's not all happy yeah, it's like things. The, it's, the decadence of freedom. Yeah, like this is the this is what can read from it. It's this this these cheats, these liars, these stealers, this kind of thing. Uh, and you know the, the American dream isn't all it's cracked up to be. Yeah. Uh, so I th- that tied into there, and I think that's pretty cool. We also get more of the technology stuff. There were several scenes where Gloria was like everyone around her was on their phone. Like there was one in the diner. Again, mm. speaking of like Lynchy and things, being at a diner feels very Twin Peaks actually. Uh, but she's at, at a diner, and like everyone else is on their phone. Like in a row, the camera like sort of pans past all these people on their phone. Uh, and obviously there was the obvious stuff with Mac, with the, uh, oh, you're not on Facebook? You should be on Facebook. It's, it's like a small yeah. town. Uh, you know, you don't have time for this, so you connect and, you know, all, all, all that stuff. Uh, which, and I, th- I think it is interesting that throughout this entire episode, she basically gets to a dead end and realises this has nothing to do with why he was killed. But then when she gets back home, it's actually fingerprints, which, I mean, it's not new technology, but relatively speaking, compared to everything else, it's like, you know, again, that relates off to the robot because the whole, the whole thing in the cartoon is that the robot's useless. Yes. Uh, much like the box, which, by the way, I I, I looked up the box. It's called the. Oh, I've forgotten it already. Uh, it was like the useless box or something like that. That's the, that, it's got yeah, a name. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, we find out in the, the cartoon that the robot also has the same switch, so he's like a useless robot. Uh, but there is worth at the end of the cartoon, though, because like when the aliens beam him up, beam him up, they say, "Oh, but you you've been through all this and you've recorded all this, so there is actual use. Like you've recorded all this in." Therefore, you are of use. So I feel like everything she's learned here will become important at some point. Yeah, because right now it feels like just such a strange distraction. Because obviously going in, we, we want to know who Thaddeus is, you know, Ennis, sure. But we don't. We know that this didn't connect to why he was killed. We knew that going in. Oh, yeah, we knew that, yeah. So from our perspective, this it feels like a strange detour in that sense. So it has to become relevant somehow later on, you'd think. Yeah, but I think I think the cartoon was clearly telling us that. It was like, yeah. the fact that you have all this knowledge will be useful. 
but it's just in what way we we can't really predict as of yet. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, we, we were talking about last week. How how is she going to like connect to what the actual like the other stories are and all that stuff? And oh, here we go. Right, they got the guy's fingerprints. Okay, there's a connection. She's going to look into why he was there, and that might lead to the Stussies and so on. Uh, and yeah, so I I, th- I think that it works in that sense. I, I just it was a really weird episode because it did it just closed itself off from every single thing else and just focused on the mystery of this this one character. Uh, there was also a lot of really weird like monologues in this because obviously she runs into uh, Rewise's character twice, like once in the plane, then again in the bar. And both times he gives these weird speeches. The first one, and again, go back to things feeling lynching. <laughs> the first one, he talks about how, oh, people were this, and then they evolved into this, and then we walked, and then we ran, and now... You know, he's talking about advancements, uh, yeah. which is kind of what she doesn't seem to like very much, is like coming into the 21st century. Yeah, he kind of relishes in it. Like he says, he's yeah. flown six times already this week, and it's only Tuesday. He He's enjoying it. <laughs> Whereas she's very resistant to it, obviously, we've seen. Yeah, and then the little speech in the bar, she, he he tells this story of uh, this soldier who goes away, and he gets this this divorce clause where if I don't come back within twelve months from the from when it hits twelve months from that day we're divorced, but if I do come back before then we're still married. So technically you're both married and divorced for twelve months. Yeah, uh, it's just it's, it's Schrodinger's cat. It's basically, with a yeah. divorce. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think there's these weird like sort of philosophical themes <laughs> seeping in. Uh, yeah. To all this, especially the stuff with the ro- the robot, because that that whole thing was him like watching all of civilization like rise up and then die. Yeah, and it, and the, just the cycle repeating. Yeah, uh, so sort of the rise and the fall of a civilization. Uh, and again, if we're talking about east and west, and we're bringing all that stuff into it, uh, that feels very relevant to it. So yeah. I, I do think it was interesting. Obviously, you mentioned you McGregor was playing one of those uh, characters. Yeah. He plays the one that basically sets the robot on the journey, because it's it's his death uh, that kind of that prompts Which, him to if, go. And if we're comparing the robot to her, it was Hugh McGregor, at least one of them, one of the Hugh McGregors, yeah. that set this murder in motion, which set yeah, her on this it's, path. It's the story of the Stussies that set this down, her, yeah. her down on this path, and then the ending, the one that beams him up at the end, is David Thewlis, who is playing VM, and he kind of closes off the robot story, so. Maybe he's going to close off Gloria's story as well. Given that he's an outright, outright villain, that, that seems like a really foreboding. It production. does, doesn't it? Uh, unless it's just a case of he'll be at the end of the story, so she, the, she'll put him away. Like she, he's the ultimate villain. She'll eventually get to him. Why? Why she'll be interested in him is actually still remains to be seen. Because at this point, even though she's connected now, she has a, she's a path to to Ray Stussy, it's just him she's really concerned with because it's just the murder of this one man. It's not, it's not about what our bro- his brother's up to. Exactly. But, and, uh, that, that's what I thought was really interesting because they, they've done that casting intentionally. Like, everything there is intentional. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm just interested to see how it plays out at the end if it is just a case of, like you said, oh, he's just there at the end or if it is he's the one in control at the end. Yeah, the other uh, philosophical monologue came from uh, old, the old version of the producer, uh, Zimmerman, uh, mm. in the old folks' home. He's got like a, one of those voice box things to speak, and he he gives this speech about life just being like random matter that collides, and then you're existing while it's collided, and then once it breaks away, you're not you no longer exist. It was a very, very sort of cosmic idea of like what life is. Yeah, and. Uh, Again, very very interesting and very, very brings in these again because the, the, the entire robot thing was the, the rise of civil not even just civilization just life on Earth and then the end of life on Earth. So mm. the idea of talking about this again it ties into that that theme. So every, everything's very focused thematically. So I can really give it a lot of credit for that. Nothing was making me go, oh, this how does this tie in? Everything tied in. It was just yeah, it was all strange things, but they all made sense. To a degree, it's just that it's just the the question, and we'll obviously we hope to find this out going through the season. But how does all this become a big part of the overall themes that we've already, we've already been discussing after the first two episodes, yeah, uh, and that kind of stuff. So no, obviously there was, there was some funny moments with uh, like the Mac character. I say Mac character, Mac from It's All the Sunny, because I, I don't know what cop, Mac cop, because uh, he basically becomes Mac from It's All the Sunny. He says awful things like. Uh, I'm, yeah, there was a... I'm, I'm, I'm just going to. I'm going to. Uh, I need to drop the kids off at school, 
It's like, oh, you have kids? And he's like, no, I need to take a shit. And that was it, kind it, of a... it wasn't at school, it was at the pool. At the pool, sorry, you're right, you're right, yeah, at the pool. But do you, know, do you know the thing about that was, is that was like another level, like, since she arrives, she feels like this odd duck, this, you know, the odd mm. one out, because she comes from this, you know, middle of nowhere in Minnesota, and she isn't big in technology, where this is LA, this is the the brink of everything, you know, all this society and all that stuff, and she, she feels like she's like this weird odd duck, even the, even the footwear she's wearing, she's wearing these like boots throughout the whole thing, where it's clearly meant for someone who's walking around in cold weather, and she's walking around LA, yeah. And these things. It was just it was just showing how out of touch she was. It was like, she's still out of touch in Minnesota with the other characters, but here it was like everything was turned it's just up too to extreme, eleven. Yeah. yeah. It was fun having Ray Wise. I was I was I, I saw I did a no shit moment when I noticed it was him sitting next yeah, to him. Yeah, yeah, he's just sat there and I was like, Oh, it's Ray Wise. What's he doing here? I didn't know he was in it. Yeah. It feels actually it feels very strange and almost too coincidental for him to run into her twice. And this is the show where in other shows, I'd go, okay, that was intentional. But Fargo's just full of coincidences that it could just be a coincidence. The question is, will we see him again? That is the question, yeah. We may not, but I could totally see him just randomly being in Minnesota because he flies a lot, apparently. So yeah, why, why not uh, be there? Uh, no, nah, I I enjoyed the episode. Uh, I think it did a lot of really interesting things, but at the same time, it was re- a really weird one. And I don't know if uh, I enjoyed it as much as the first two because it was missing a lot of these other characters that I, that I do enjoy. At the same time, I do think it was important for her, uh, but by her own very nature, she's a very like sort of subdued character who's very yeah. sort of uh, like laid back and kind of does things old school by the book, sort of following up on these leads in a almost mundane kind of way. Yeah, it's, it's old-fashioned. Yeah, uh, and it makes for a really sort of relaxed episode, as much as some of it was quite interesting. I almost feel like you could have had like a subplot in Fargo, or uh, in Minnesota, as <laughs> so yeah. it was in Fargo, uh, you know, alongside this, and I wouldn't have really felt like they were taking much away from this. Yeah, I know what you mean, because this show often feels like there's a lot of tension in every episode, like, yeah. how's stuff going to play down, and with her, you don't really feel that. She's following this story, you know, she's doing the detective work, but it never feels like, okay, we need to get through this, there's no there's no rush, it's there's all no, just kind of, it, get, it gets along with it. There's no urgency to the, to the story yeah. in this one, and it, it makes it feel very sort of laid back as a result. Obviously, the flashback's are a little bit more... Uh, interested in that sense because you feel like he's being played and you're sort of waiting for that to like boil yeah. up but uh nah so I, so it makes for kind of a more of a lukewarm episode i think in my opinion but hmm. i feel like i enjoyed it well enough now but i'll enjoy it much more later in the season once these things Probably, become relevant yeah. and i go okay that's what the purpose of this episode was because right now it's just kind of here's a lot of information that kind of seems useless at the minute but yeah, I think right now I'm kind of of the opinion that it's like uh it's like I liked all the weird stuff. Like when it when it got almost David Lynch like and it was like dropping these weird mystic clues, I was kind of into it. And yeah, that, that's when I got the most like, excited because it was like doing something really interesting. Whereas, whereas the rest of it was so kind of just laid back and mm. kind of you know taking in the scenery. But to be fair, she did get her suitcase stolen by a Santa. That sums it up. Uh, let us know what you thought of this week's Fargo uh, in the comments below. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. Helps us out a lot. Get us on Twitter at mailed underscore fudge for channel updates. Uh, but that's us, guys. So thanks very much. Uh, and have you got any vanilla?